Chapter 10 was a really heavy chapter involving a lot of different concepts. So we want to take a moment and regroup and just make sure we've understood some of the really fundamental concepts about hypothesis testing. So let's recap it in this table to begin with. So we've had two sections, 10.2 and 10.3, which were about single population hypothesis testing. Now on on this particular semester when I'm making this video, this is on page 328 for 10.2 and page 329 for 10.3. Let me double check those real quickly. Yep, 328 and 329. There they are. Right. So, and of course, that might change in later semesters. So if you're watching this at a later date, um, it might be different. So put down whatever dates are appropriate for you. Um, so the single proportion test has step three, a step three value um, in the hypothesis testing method right here, step three, the test statistic of T0 or Z0. So for proportions, it's C0, which is this formula right here. And then for means, it's T0, which is this formula right here. And to save us all time and aggravation, I just typed those right in to your table for you. Now, what were we assuming? and what are we testing? So our null hypothesis for um, this particular test, for a single proportion test, our null hypothesis talks about our parameter p. So you're assuming in your null hypothesis somewhere that p is equal to some particular value. So that would be p, the population proportion. And then the statistic you're using to test that would be p hat, which is your sample proportion. So you use a p hat to test the p0 that you assumed to be true. So you assumed p0, which was a population proportion in the null hypothesis. So you assume p was equal to p0 in the null hypothesis. So some population proportion value. And then you use p hat to test that. And then you create a test statistic based off of the ideas of standard error of the sample proportions to figure this out. So a z-score, which is p hat minus p0 divided by the standard error of p0. So you're using the statistic sample proportion to test the parameter of the population proportion that you assume to be true. Now for a mean, the population parameter that you're assuming to be true in your null hypothesis is actually a mu value, mu zero. So you're assuming that mu is equal to mu zero in your null hypothesis. And that's why the back end of that formula has a mu zero assumed. There we go. Now the test statistic we use to test that is the front end of that z-score formula, or t-score formula, which is x bar, the sample mean. So you're saying, hey, how far apart are my sample mean and my hypothesized population mean? Let's divide it by the standard error and see. All right, how will we know what's being asked for? Well, that's a little bit tricky. You're going to have to look for words like um, test hypothesis test or test the value or test your assumptions or you know test, 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 those words. And the proportion ones will talk about proportions or have proportions mentioned. And then the sample mean ones will have the mean and the standard deviation mentioned. So there you have it. So you'll have um, test the hypothesis with proportions mentioned or percents given somewhere. That'll be a proportion hypothesis test. And then means and averages are mentioned. Or if they give you a data set, you know, a table with some data in it, that would be a hypothesis test for the means slash averages, right? So if you see the average, the word average floating around. Now, what requirements do you have to check? Well, for proportions, it's very similar to the ones you had for a confidence interval. It's just that instead of using p hat to check normality, we would use p0, right? Because we actually have a hypothesized population mean. So we assume it to be true, and then we can check whether or not our data set is roughly normal or not. Don't forget that the independent sample part, if you're sampling with replacement, you don't have to worry about it at all. It's always independent. But if you're sampling without replacement, then you want your sample size to be less than 5% of your population size. And you might actually have to calculate that if the population size was given, or if you don't have the population size, but you can kind of guess, well, a thousand people is way less than 5% of all adult Americans or something like that. Then you can kind of wave your hand at it like a magician. So the first two parts for the mean are 
basically the same. The normality is a little bit different though because of the central limit theorem for means you either have to be given that the graph um, that the data set was normal or maybe a normal probability plot graph shows you that it's normal or we use the rule of thumb that n is greater than 30. Now keep in mind the normality here for proportions is not 30. It's generally going to be more than 30 because you know we wouldn't trust a survey that only talked to 30 people, right? So we would need more than that. Um, but for means, 30 is perfectly fine. Now the calculator entry, if you look back here on the pages, I actually tell you what the calculator entry is right there at the top in that little gray highlight section. So t-test is the one for the means and one prop z test is the one for proportions. There we go. And it's telling you right there in the formula as well as in the calculator entry what distribution you're using. You're using the z distribution for the proportion test and the student's t distribution for the t test. And you can see it in the test statistic of course, t0, and you can see it in the t test that you're using for the calculator. Now step four is how you find your critical values. And it's very similar to how you found them for um, confidence intervals. It's just that for confidence intervals they're always plus or minus z alpha over 2. But for hypothesis tests it could be negative z alpha for a left-tailed test or positive z alpha for a right-tailed test. There and I actually labeled them. TT for two-tailed, um, negative z alpha is a left-tailed LT and then positive z alpha is a right-tailed. And you can either get those from inverse norm. Again, that's generally the left tail area unless you have the most recent newest edition of the calculator which will allow you left, right, or center. But in general we taught it with the left tail area. Now for the t test it's the same thing. It's just that it's plus or minus t alpha over 2, um, negative t alpha and positive t alpha. Oop, hold on, let me, let me paste that in a way that doesn't make it go wonky. There we have it. So negative, or excuse me, plus or minus t alpha over 2, negative t alpha, or positive t alpha. And you again use inverse t just like we did with um, confidence intervals. Or we can use the t table. Just remember that your degrees of freedom is n minus 1. And before we leave this page, I want to issue you a warning real quickly. And that warning is to be careful not to mix up the level of significance alpha with either your hypotheses in step one or your test statistic in step three. Alpha is used in steps four and five to either create your critical values with the classical method or to compare the p to the p-value and make decisions in step five. That's it. So don't start throwing alpha earlier into the test statistic formula. A lot of students try to do that and it's a recipe for disaster. So be very careful that whatever number you wrote for step two as your alpha level is not getting mixed up into earlier parts of the formulas for step three or step one for your hypotheses. It should be part of steps four and five. It's how you help create yourself the critical values and it's how you compare or what you compare your p-value to to make your decisions or your critical value to um, to make your decisions. But that's it.